So next things, uh, the next thing that we need to learn about is function functions. So um, functions in Python. So essentially, okay, when do you need to should when should you use functions? Whenever you want to um, encapsulate a task that contains multiple instructions, and um, if you want to repeat that task multiple times, then it makes sense to create a function. So a simple task that we might want to include in a function is to take a a split function that takes a, a string, and then it should sp split that string at a specific character that we provide. Right, so in, um, in Python, we have this def syntax to, to um, indicate that we create a function, then the function name, and then the parameters in here. And then we, here we have the um, commands that we want to execute, and then the return statement is what we, what, what we want the function to return. So I, I guess you might be familiar with this. But um, so then how do you call it? So if you have a string message equals hi sun, and then we can use the function name, and then the two arguments if we head up here. The string is here, then the message. And then you can also provide the explicit name of the argument that you want to use. So split car equals i. You can run this. And then you can see we get a tuple out. And uh, here you can see in the return statement, I used the tuple notation. So this is the first component here. This is the second component. And I didn't use the brackets here. It was just lazy. So um, yeah, I mean, this is how functions work. Um, something that you will see quite often is that you have a function, and you want to return multiple um, objects in that function. So, um, and I just want to show you how this works, and that the syntax is, or, and how that the syntax is quite nice. But I also want you to explain to explain to you how it works. So, um, classical example: you want to have a function that is supposed to return some coordinates, right? So, for instance, some x and y values, and a very simple um, implementation is here: def coordinates x equals one, y equals two, and then we return x comma y. And so really what's going on here is we, we, that we return a tuple. I just used the notation without the brackets, right? but it's the same thing. But really, we're just returning one item, and that item is a tuple containing two values, namely x and y. Because in Python, functions can actually just return one um, object. But of course, if you use tuples, then the tuple might can contain uh, two values. So then. What do we do with the, when we call that function? Right? Coordinates doesn't have any arguments. Then the output variable is x, y. And then we can get the two components of the output. Right? So it was a tuple with two entries. And we can use the index notation to get the first entry, and then this, another index notation to get the second entry. You could do it this way, but it's not very elegant. And there's a much more elegant way of doing it in Python. And that's. Uh, it's called, I think, tuple extraction. Um, so essentially, what's going on is you, you can call coordinates, and then you can also um, you can just provide the two um, two variables that are supposed to um, contain the well, the items in the tuple. So essentially, what's going on is that coordinates returns a tuple. Python unpacks that tuple and assigns the values of the first item in the tuple to x and the second item in the tuple to y. So instead of having these three lines, we can now just have a, a single line. And of course, what is important here is that the length is consistent. So if my, if my coordinate returned three items, then I would get an um, error message down here saying, I have too many values to unpack. Right? So I, have, uh, I provide three values up here. But here, I only have uh, two variables. So then, in order to get this to work, I would have to add a, a third one here. And it works again. So very useful um, syntax that you will see quite often. Next item. So I've heard that, um, um, at least in the beginner courses, you, uh, 
encouraged to document every single line of your code and explain what it does. And so that is maybe a good idea to do when you start programming, but it's definitely not a good idea on how to document your code when you collaborate with other people or also when you, um, uh, when you document the code for yourself, right? If you want to read it again in two years. So um, in this is cost, we will actually have quite a bit of uh, documentation will be quite important. And I will, um, I think this is making noises again. Huh? And um, I will teach you a little bit of documentation now, but um, I will also talk a little more about documentation next time. And also in the future assignments, you will review each other's documentation. Um, also, documentation will be part of the um, uh, how we give po points to your assignments from this assignment on. Okay, but the, the first fundamental um, documentation that you should always have, uh, almost always have, is um, so-called doc strings. And these doc strings I've already mentioned at the very beginning are documentations that document what a function does, or a class does, or a module does. And the nice thing in Python is that it's a, there's a standard way of writing these documentation strings, and that it's very easy. Uh, namely, when you define a new function, then if there's a string line immediately after the function definition, it becomes automatically a documentation string. So all you need to do is, when you create a new function, after that function definition, just have a string um, and add the document documentation in there. And that autom becomes automatically a doc string. So for instance, if here I have a, a function, positive sign, and um, it just returns the max of zero and the sign of x. And uh, here's, uh, here's a good doc string, how, uh, how a good doc string might look like. So I typically have kind of the first line describes in very briefly what that function does. Right? In this case, calculates max zero sine x and returns the result. I mean, it's a very simple function, so it's not so exciting. But um, for more complex functions, um, it's good practice to, um, um, to have some new lines here. So, I mean, you can use multi-line strings if you want to have uh, more detailed documentation. And then you can uh, provide, for instance, the arguments in here and so on and so forth. And so if you want to, I added, so there's some standard waves on how you can write these doc strings. I added a link here. This is how um, Google, uh, Google internally uh, tells the employees on how to write doc strings. So this link uh, gives you a kind of a reference module with functions and classes, and it tells you how you're supposed to write it if you're working at Google, right? It doesn't need that, you don't necessarily need to adopt that, but I mean, it's, I think it works quite well. So here you can see how, it, how this looks like, right? So they also document the arguments that are being passed in. They even specify the types that you're supposed to pass in, and they specify the return values. And so later on in this course, I will actually show you how we can create automatic documenta documentation web pages out of uh, out of your source code. But um, so how do you benefit from the doc strings that you've written? Well, the first thing is that, let me just execute that. That's, um, so first of all, as soon as you've, um, um, if you're working in, in, environment, in an interactive environment, like I'm here in my IPython environment, um, you can actually access these document strings while you're working. So let's say now I've forgotten what the positive sign does. I can just type in positive sign and then question mark. And then down here, my editor brings up the documentation for me and I can remind myself what the arguments do, right? And so depending on your editor, you might have a different way of accessing these doc strings. But, um, That's all on documentation for now. So now the next big topic is classes. 
So um, have you all worked with classes before? Yeah? OK. So it's going to be a recap. So um, classes um, essentially um, collect. Is it, so classes are being used if you want to collect functions and variables um, together that somehow belong together. So kind of a classical, maybe a good example is if you want, is if you want, you're supposed to have a software digital twin of a car, right? And um, so of course the car has a lot of functions that you want to implement. So you can start the car, you can fuel it up, you can set the speed, but it also has some, so these are functions that are being called, but it also has some attributes like which type of fuel does it have? What is the max speed and so on? And so to collect all these um, um, functions and attributes together, one creates a class. So in Python, um, the um, class of a car could, for instance, look like this. So um, we use the class syntax up here, and then we give the class a name. And then um, by default, classes should always, so this is actually the subclass from which our class inherits. And so usually you should use the um, object class here um, if you don't want to in inherit from, your, from another class. So then we also use a doc string, like, um, just like in functions. Then we have a constructor. Um, our constructor, this is being called whenever we create a new instance of that class. Then we have a start function. So we can start the car and we have an accelerate function. So these are two functions that we defined as part of our, um, of our class. And we have some class variables. You can see it's the year, the construction year, then which type of fuel it takes and the current speed. These are variables that are specific to each uh, car instance. So one thing that um, you should um, uh, note in contrast to kind of traditional funct or normal functions is that um, the class functions always take this self as a first argument. Um, and I explain um, in a second what the self does. But you can see both the constructor has the self start has the self, and accelerate has the self, self function. So what is this um, self label? It's, um, what it does is it, um, what happens is that our Python automatically passes the object itself as a first argument to any um, member functions. So let's say I've created a car. I should maybe um, just tell you how to create the car. So if you say my car equals car 2007 and scene, this is how we can create a car. And then we call my car.start. So remember our start definition had a self variable as the first argument. And um, Python automatically, um, so what this syntax is equivalent to calling car.start. So now I use the class name start. And then here's the self equals my car. So I pass in the instance um, of the class as the self label. So these things, this happens automatically. And this is how you could write it out explicitly. So why do you need that? Why do you need the self? It allows you to access um, instance-specific attributes of your, of your um, object. So for instance, if you have the start, the, our start method takes in self, and I want to print the sound that that specific car makes. Right? And so different instances of cars might make different sounds. And so the self um, here, the, the self.sound, allows me to access the specific, uh, the variable value of that specific card that um, I'm working with. 
So I hope this becomes now, uh, so I guess you, you see it once you start working with classes. But um, okay, so how do we now use our, our class? So we can create a new car, we specify a year and a fuel. These were the two arguments that the init function um, expected. Except that it doesn't work, okay. Let's see, ah, oh, I didn't execute that. Okay, so now we have a, um, by calling simply car, as, it was, if, as if it was a function, we created the, um, we called the init function. And now we can do operations on that car. So for instance, we can start it. So if we start it, then we execute the start function and we, and the start function printed out the sound that it makes. So we just get room as a output. And then we can also, um, for instance, um, call the accelerate function. That was the second function that we implemented. And um, you can call functions, but you can also access attributes of our, of our car. So we, uh, my car dot fuel was an attribute. So then we get the string here out. You could also ask for the sound, for instance. So um, start and accelerate, these were kind of just um, standard class methods that we implemented, but there are also some magic class methods that um, you can implement and that are actually quite useful to implement in your own classes. So for instance, um, currently when we print our, if we just create a car and then we try to print it, we get a very boring um, output here. So um, I mean, it, it tells us essentially which class type it is, and then it tells us the memory address on where that car lives, right? So, um, but often it's quite useful to, um, to make a more informative um, string representation of our classes. So how can we do that? Well, um, so what happens here is that when you try to print a class, Python first tries to convert it to a string, and then it prints that string. And um, a string conversion is normally done with a string and then, uh, and then the object. And um, so when you try to call string and then a class instance, what Python will internally try to do is it tries to call, it checks if there's a method implemented, um, underscore, underscore, string, underscore, underscore. And if it does, then it calls that method, it's supposed to return a string, and uses that string as a representation of that class instance. If this method is not implemented, then it just falls back to this uh, generic uh, string representation with a memory address. The same thing happens if you um, try to multiply two class objects, right? At the moment, car1 times car2 doesn't really make sense, but in principle, if we had implemented, um, if we implemented class uh, function underscore underscore mul underscore underscore that takes in um, one car, for instance, right, and then um, does some operation, then um, and return a new car, then in principle we could define multiplication of cars. Right? Same with addition, and of course also same with equality, right? Maybe you want to define an equality of um, op class objects. So there's many of these. These are called magic uh, class functions. And if you want to have a full um, reference, um, I've added the link down here. But I want to show you how we can make the string representation more interesting. So all we need to do is we take our original class, um, a class um, definition, and in addition to the init function and the start and the accelerate, we also now define a string method. And all that string method is supposed to do is to ret return a string um, that represents that class. And you can already see here, I'm still using the old format syntax, so I should probably change that. But so essentially that string 
representation is this is a car form, and then I plug in the self dot year. So I use the self variable to access the instance specific uh, year of that car, and then self dot fuel and self dot speed. So we can define that. And so now we can test this again. So I define a new car. Um, and now I try to print it or ask for the string representation. It's the same thing. And then I get a nice, a nice representation. So I can also print would do the same thing here. Does that make sense? So now I want to show you a more advanced uh, use case of these magic uh, class methods. Uh, so here's a use case that I had a uh, few years ago. I had, um, so, um, so I needed a function f that took in two coordinates, x and y, but it also had some additional parameters, a, b, and c. And so in there was, there was kind of complicated uh, um, uh, mathematics, but then essentially I just returned a single value. And so now I wanted to send in that function into um, another function. It was called quit values, right? And you can see it takes in my function up here, uh, plus some, essentially it, um, what it did is, um, I have a quit with x and y coordinates, and I wanted to execute that function at every um, quit cell and write out the results in a file. So the way I do it, so my, I loop over all the x coordinates, I loop over all the y coordinates, and then I evaluate that function at that x and y coordinate, write it out, uh, remember the result, and then write out the result to file. The problem was that, um, um, in here, this was an external library. So in, in the f function here, only was supposed to take x and y. While my, my function was parameterized by these additional a, b, and c. Right? So um, right now, the, the way it's implemented right now, it would just fail. So I pass in this f, but then it would, um, I would try to call f with x and y, and then Python would complain that um, f actually takes five arguments, but I'm only providing two. So how do we solve this problem? So the, the first um, solution that you might consider is to introduce global variables. Um, so we make a, b, and c global, um, globally available to the entire program. And then we can make f only take in x and y because a, b, and c are global, so we don't need to pass them as arguments. And then down here, we, I can specify which values I want to have and call grid values. Okay, so this, uh, might, this might work, but in general, you should, it's kind of considered very bad design to use global variables. Very quickly, you will get into uh, problems when you use um, the same variable names in your program, and both of them are global, right? It becomes very messy very quickly. So maybe that's not the best way to go about it. So another solution is to use default values for your parameters. So um, remember when we define functions, we can provide the variable names, but we can also provide default uh, values. And then we don't need to provide, then when we call that function and we don't specify what I, A, B, and C is, then Python will just use this default values. So um, essentially we could um, define our function like this and then pass it to grid values, it will work. Now the problem is that um, if I want to choose different values than these default, val than these default values, again, I'm, uh, this becomes useless. So now comes our, of course, uh, magic class method solution to all of this. So there is a class, magic class method called underscore underscore call underscore underscore. And um, this is always called, so if you create a class instance, like my car, and you just call my car brackets, 
with some uh, parameters in there. So you just pretend that your class is a function. What then Python will do, it will check if you've implemented this call operator, and it will execute that. Okay? So you can essentially you can make class instances behave like functions. And this is the solution that we want to use. So make a class uh, um, behave like a function um, instead of only implementing a pure function. So the strategy now is we make um, all the parameters a, b, and c. We make these class attributes, and then we implement this magic call function. Uh, that, and that will then only take two arguments. So this is what the solution looks like. Um, we, we create a class capital F. Um, so, um, and then when we instantiate a new class of this, we need to provide the three variables that we want to have fixed, right? We can have default variables in here, we don't need to. So, um, but essentially, A, B, and C need to be stored as class members of that variable. And so now, we also implement our special call method. Uh, call method is the one that is being called when we treat our class instance like a function. And of course, now this should only supposed to have two arguments, namely x and y, so that it fits um, to our requirements. And then we can do our calculations. And whenever we need to access uh, these uh, a, b, and c variables, I can just write self.a. And then I, reference, I have a reference back to the, to the parameters that I'm looking for. And then x and y are provided explicitly by that call method. So now the beautiful thing is, if I um, execute this, and, oops. So now, how do I use that? First, I instantiate a new class, capital F. I provide the A, B, and C parameters that I want to use. Then I have a small f. Now this is a class instance. So it's not a function, but it behaves like a function. So I can just call f x equals 0 0.1 and y equals 0 0.5. I mean, I don't, you don't necessarily need to provide this. But um, you can see that you get a number out. So you have a class that behaves like a function through this magic, through this ma magic call method. Does that make sense? So, um, so just uh, one comment here on uh, object orientation. So, in, um, um, this is kind of what differs. Um, kind of differences between compiled languages like C++ and Java and uh, more dynamic languages like Python. So in, in, in Python, what we can implement um, functions that take in an object v, and then we call v.start. So it's a simple start function. And um, this function here will work with any object that has implemented a dot start uh, function. So you might, so for instance, right, specifically our car, we have implemented a start function, so we can call start my car. But um, if you have another, if you have a bike or something, and the bike has a start method implemented, you could also pass in a bike. So um, in Python, it's very easy to write functions that operate on a wide range of um, objects. You can pass in essentially whatever you want, as long as it has the required uh, attributes and functions that you use in that, um, uh, in that function. So in um, implementing like this, so this seems very intuitive if, you, if you're used to Python. But um, in C++ and Java, this is actually much, uh, much more involved. So um, what you would need to do is you would have to um, create a, um, a mother class. I mean, one way of doing that is to, if you want to implement this, is to create a mother class, maybe vehicle or something like this. Uh, and then the start method would need to take in a vehicle object. And then cars 
and bikes and uh, golf car, for instance, uh, would all inherit from from that vehicle. Um, so um, that's because it's much uh, stricter typed. Yeah, so just uh, for you to be aware of that. Okay, so now we have, I have a bit more time. So I wonder, I can, um, I can either show you the remaining of the Bash lecture of last week, um, or I show you a quick um, Python trick that I'm using often, uh, or we just stop early. Oh, you want to know? Okay, Python trick. So, Let's see if I have it um, here. Um, okay, I, you know, I think I do this interactively. So you know IPython? Okay, so... Um, Okay, IPython is an interactive uh, Python shell that you can start. You just type in IPython, and then um, you're in an interactive Python shell. And in here, you can essentially um, uh, interactively uh, write up your Python program. So you can say you can define variables, um, you can print uh, variables, you can import modules for math import sign, You get, um, when you make mistakes, you get kind of nice um, uh, out error messages with uh, syntax highlighting. Um, there's bash completion, so if I just type in S and then I press tab multiple times, then I can see the options of functions that start with S. And so I have the sinus in here. And then I can compute the sinus of A and I get the output. So, um, okay, so this is really um, useful to kind of quickly experiment um, with small um, Python scripts. But um, what's really useful is that you can, if you have a complex, if you've implemented um, your code and there's a bug somewhere, um, what you can do is you can start such an interactive Python shell exactly where your bug is. And then you can start exploring which variables you have and you can. Uh, ask for the different variables and figure out what is going on. And so I want to show you how this works. So here we have our simple, this is the initial code that I had the, at the very beginning. So remember this just took some, uh, this just uh, took in the first argument and computed the sinus and then it printed the sinus out. So let's say I want to jump in here and start exploring. Um, maybe there's something going on here, so I want to explore the variable uh, values at this point. What you can do is you import this embed function. So the, from the IPython module, you import the function embed. And then you just call it wherever. So this can actually, you can import it at the beginning if you want. But you call the embed function at the point where you want to um, explore um, the state of your program. So now if I run this, so I call python hw.py and let's say um, 2.0. So now what has happened is that the execution started and when I hit the embed command, I was, um, I jumped into such an interactive Python shell. And so now you can, of course, I mean, you can define new variables if you want to. Um, yeah, I mean, just like uh, what we had before, right? But you can also ask for the variables that have been defined in the program. So for instance, x, you can check what x is, right? x was 2.0, uh, which is the number that I provided here. And I can, for instance, check the type of x, 
gets a float, so the conversion has been done correctly. I can also check what the sinus x is, and so on and so forth. So this is something that, uh, I mean, for this simple example, it's a bit, uh, it's maybe, uh, yeah, you can see if there's a bug, but if you have a more complex program where you jump between different libraries, this is extremely useful. 